Isn't it too hard or too disappointing to play your own games uh, when you own, you know all the tricks and uh, you know how it works behind? <laughs> Actually, that's a good test, I think, whether the game works or not. So even if I know how it works, uh, there's still... Uh, every, every map is different, every mission is different, every, every time the game plays a little differently. So um, if there is a trick, then we really call that an exploit, and we take, try to take that out of the game. So uh, after, after most players play for a while, they know how the game works, they understand the rules, um, and we want to make sure the game is still a challenge, still is surprising at that point. So it's kind of a good test. If the game still is challenging for me and still surprises me, even though I know the rules behind it, then it's going to be a good game for players, even after they've played many, many times. So, yeah, I, I, I try to make games that still that I, that I can't actually solve, that still are fun to play, even after I've known all the rules and, and played it many, many times. Okay, so you still get surprises when you play I, your own game. I still get surprises. <laughs> I was doing a demo earlier today when I, my starship got blown up, and I was like, well, wait a minute, that's not supposed <laughs> to happen. This is the easy level. But I still get surprises from my games, yes. How would you define the art of creating a video game? Creating a video game is lots of fun. That's, I think that's a starting point because we're trying to create a fun experience for the player and, and we're playing the game uh, you know, every day, we're playing the latest version. So we, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of fun to make video games. I think it's um, a creative process in that we don't really know all the answers when we're starting. We don't have a storyboard with everything figured out. We're, we just have some basic ideas. You know, we, we like we want starships, we want construction, we want building, we want some adventures. But every day you're trying a new idea. Some days it works, sometimes it doesn't work, and you're 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 iterating, you're adding new things. The artists are building. You know, they they walk into your office and they look what I made. Oh, where put this in the game right now? <laughs> uh, so it's a it's a process where every day is different. Every day you see hopefully some progress, and you can watch this game just turn from very rough, crude prototype into a, a really cool game. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the process is um, very satisfying in that way that um, <clears throat> we're not working on projects that are going to take 10, 15, 20 years to complete. We can actually experience the beginning, the middle, and the end of a project, which is, which is great. And then we can get feedback, you know, it's in, start to talk to our, our players, our, our community. There's that whole aspect, once it goes out there, that you're you're, you're, you know, you, you know what you tried to put in the game, and now you're getting feedback as, well, this worked, this could be a little better, or, you know, that, and then you can go through the process of trying to make it even, even better. But it's a, I think I have to say, primarily, it's, I mean, every day is a new experience, and, and seeing a little bit of progress every day is very satisfying. It's a great part of making, making video games. Okay, and if a child asked you uh, how to follow your steps, uh, which studies you should make and everything, what should you answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny you should ask that because <laughs> my son, who is uh, uh, now 25 years old, um, was interested in video games, went to the university, uh, studied computer engineering, computer programming, um, actually worked for a couple of years at Blizzard and is now working at Firaxis and, okay. in game development and, and design. Uh, and he played a lot of video games. I would say that's one thing you should do if you want to get involved in video game design. He played lots of video games. He loved uh, World of Warcraft. That was his favorite game. And uh, learned programming um, and kind of interned at different companies and just got that experience that allowed him to be really good at, at, at helping to make video games. Okay. Do you think that uh, video game has become cooler uh, for, for people in the, in the last years? I think it, we certainly hear from people who want to get in, into the industry. How do I get to be making video games? How do I become a video game designer? We're seeing many more university courses in video game design and video game programming. Um, even in art a curriculum, you know, how to do 3D graphics, how to do modeling, how to do texturing. So a lot of the um, young people are learning the skills um, at the university or at home or playing video games that before they, we would have to teach them when they came to Euphoraxis. And artists might be good at drawing, but they wouldn't have been able to learn 3D modeling, you know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. So I think that that coolness is, uh, is spreading to university and, you know, we have a generation that's grown up playing video games, so it's, it's a big part of our, our culture. And I think that, you know, we, we, we do hear from a lot of people that kind of have 
played our games and, and grown up with our games. We, we recently had a Firaxicon where the, for the first time I would meet father and son that both played our games or mother and daughter. Or even, <laughs> there's a generational connection now with video games. So that's, that's really been, been fun to see that. Okay, uh, and I, I'm sure you will hate this question, but um, <laughs> what would you answer to people who think that video game is useless or even dangerous? <laughs> well, they shouldn't be playing video games. Uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> a I, I certainly, I, you know, I, I, video games aren't for everybody. We're not, I'm not saying everybody should be playing video games, but we do every now and then hear some kind of positive stories about um, a person who played pirates and, and impressed their teacher with their knowledge of all the cities in the, in the Caribbean or someone who uh, knows something about history from playing civilization. And uh, there's a little bit of, of learning, in, in, I think, in all strategy games. And you, you get better at something, you kind of become familiar with uh, technology and, and, and leaders in history. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of people, I think it's a, it's a positive experience. It really exercises your brain. It, in, it encourages you to think, uh, to think creatively, to solve problems. So I think there's lots of great things mm. about video games. Yeah, because uh, when I was a student in uh, history, I was personally very happy to know uh, the whole list of the name of the Aztec city <laughs> and, uh, and uh, the exactly. technology tree of the Iron Age. <laughs> yes. and, um, uh, and I've read that some teachers use civilization to teach their students like economics or history or uh, military strategy. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, how wide do you see your role as a teacher for, uh, for your uh, clients? <laughs> Um, we don't really design the games to be educational, but there's um, a lot of learning, there's a lot of uh, problem solving, um, you know, when, when you play Civilization. Uh, generally, you're, you're, you're experiencing history, you're, you're um, learning something about the great leaders, about what happened in the world, how things work, uh, how economics connects with uh, diplomacy and, and all the different pieces, how they fit together. So I think there's a, there's an element of learning in games, even though they're not designed to be educational. I think some teachers find that it is valuable to to uh, allow their kid, their students to um, to play Civilization and, and 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 learn about some of those things. Which other video games are so cool that you wish you could have the ID first? <laughs> <laughs> I always said Tetris. You know, it was so simple but so beautiful. That was a game that I, I should have thought of that first. You know, but, <laughs> but I I'm happy that that. That's out there. Uh, I I really love seeing great video games. You know that that, that are. Out there. I mean, Minecraft certainly is a is a wonderful example of a of a great video game. I uh, you know I think and um, <clears throat> a lot of the strategy games, anything the Blizzard has made, or uh, certainly the Civ games. Um, but uh, you know I I enjoy making the games that I make. I'm not jealous of other designers. I I'm happy that there are other people making great games that that we can play and when we're not busy making it, making our own games. But it, I think it's a great time to be a gamer with all the different um, genres, all the different styles of gaming. Um, you know, there's some, there's just some fantastic games out there. Okay. For the launch of C5, I remember you played the role of a janitor in the, uh, in the uh, <laughs> funny uh, Seven on video. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you seem to be aware that some people just can't resist your games, right? <laughs> I'm aware of that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, uh, yes, we have the, the we call the one more turn phenomenon, which is um, <clears throat> it seems to be something about civilization that's hard to stop playing. And we actually kind of tried to analyze, you know, what is it about civilization that makes it uh, give it that one more turn idea? And there's Did just you, you suffer from it <laughs> yourself. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> sometimes at work we have to prevent people from playing the new games because we need to actually finish them. But there, there's something about um, having many different things, uh, you know, exploring in one area, building a new wonder over here, uh, negotiating with another leader over here. There's always many things happening and there's never a moment in Civ where everything is stopped and everything is finished. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we were able to um, get Civ players to think into the future, to plan, to, to project and imagine you know, the, the next thing I'm looking forward to is, you know, seeing what's over here. And they're always kind of thinking ahead. And, le you know, I think that's the reason why it's hard. You want to play one more turn because you know something is going to happen, you know, that's going to change the world or going to, uh, you know, you're going to uncover something cool. So, um, did, did you, know, you, we were did sorry. you spend some, uh, some nights on, uh, on your games? <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. there. <laughs> <laughs> Just playing, not creating? <laughs> we, uh, I think in one of the earlier series, we actually put a timer in there. With 
<laughs> you could set it and it would go off and after a certain amount of time so you you could stop playing but uh, but mm -hmm. just the way it is. <laughs> so uh, just in order to prevent any suicide amongst the Civ addicts uh, when the time comes, uh, can you tell us now when you will stop creating games? <laughs> <laughs> I have no plans to stop creating games. I have the best job in, in the world. I mean, I, I love making games. Um, we are... Uh, <clears throat> I mean, Starships was a lot of fun to make. I um, want to assure everybody that we, even though Starships runs on PC and the iPad, we're we love PC. Um, every time we do something on a different platform, there's a little bit of concern. Are we stopping the PC? But no, we, we, we love the PC. Uh, PC is a wonderful strategy platform. It's just that sometimes with, with XCOM, for example, it also worked very well on consoles. And with Starships, it works really well on, uh, on the iPad. Um, but that's just because of the way our technology works and, 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 and uh, the game is, is, is designed on the PC and it's the, the, the strategy game that we really I uh, wanted to make uh, so it's uh, we love making games we'll continue to make games um, again just to assure people uh, Starships is there's no uh, in app purchases there's no nothing else you need to play the game it's just uh, uh, you buy the game if you've got everything that you need to play okay <laughs> Um, I've always wondered why your name was on the game titles, and I've read, uh, you will tell me if it's true, that Robin Williams gave the ID to Microprose. <laughs> there are a few different stories going around. <laughs> um, as I remember it, uh, um, uh, in the early days, uh, I had done a couple of flight simulator games, F-15, <clears throat> and uh, solo flight, and I did a submarine simulation, military games. Um, but then I, I got the idea to do pirates, uh, and, and, and more of a role-playing adventure game. And uh, my partner Bill Staley, Wild Bill Staley, who was a former Air Force guy, said, "You know, no, 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 pirates. We want more military, more military games. You know." Uh, and I said, mm, "I really want to do this pirates game." And he said, "Okay, well, we'll put your name on it. So if they like the other games, maybe they'll try." The pirate game and so we did the pirate game and it was a good game and so it's well hey that worked pretty well let's put your name on the next game that you do and so from then on uh, pretty much when I make a game or when a game is made a sequel to one of my games it, it has my name on it okay that's the way I remember it I don't I've never met Robin Williams, so I, he, might, he might have had the idea separately. But <laughs> okay, so, but you're aware that uh, in France, uh, many people think your, your real name is Sid Meier's. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, there's never any blood or gore in your game, so uh, is that your decision? Yes. Um, uh, I don't think it's necessary. Um, you know, Kind of funny in in railroad tycoon which was a game we, we wrote a long time ago um there was a it was possible to, for a bridge to go out and your train would go into the river but we had a little cinematic where that everybody was jumping out of the train before it went into the <laughs> so nobody was injured so happy uh, end. <laughs> <laughs> and in our in our uh in our the last version of, of pirates uh oh, this is fun um uh, when the enemy ship was sinking, all the crew would be jumping off into the water. So we, it was almost a joke for a while that nobody ever died in, in <laughs> our games, you know. Uh, I, I, it just is something that um, we don't think is necessary to enjoy the game. So it's easier we, to sleep after that. I see, yeah. <laughs> and I actually, probably my son, you know, for, I've been playing games with him for as long as he's been uh, able to play. And, I think as a parent, you feel a little bit of a you know a responsibility to because you know lots of kids are playing these games. So uh, try to make the you know the message as positive as you can. I think. Okay. Um, do you think that the video game ecosystem is better now than uh, ten or twenty years ago? Uh, I mean, the the market is of course wider, but uh, is it more interesting than before? I think it is. I think there are a number of things that that uh, we can do now that we couldn't do ten or fifteen years ago. Probably the the internet and the connection with players, the ability to create mods and share mods, uh, has has made games uh, just a lot more interesting, a lot more have a lot more 
um, <clears throat> a lifetime, a longer lifetime. The ability to patch <laughs> is very, very handy once in a while, <laughs> um, and to do updates, to do expansions, and you know, I think that um, whereas back 20 years ago we just handed you a disc and said goodbye. Uh, now it's a whole longer process, of a, a stronger connection between the designer and the creators and the and the players. Mm -hmm. um, then you have forums where people are talking about strategies and ideas and things like that. So it's a much richer world today than we than we had uh, when we started. Okay. And have you ever had like a huge crisis with an emergency patching? Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh... We have had one or two of those. We try to not do that. But uh, yes, there's there's always a, that one little thing that, that sneaks through once in a while. And so we're, we're, we're happy to have the ability to fix those things very quickly. Okay. Okay. Um, in 2005, you said that you would be happy to work on a dinosaur game uh, that you put <laughs> on the shelf earlier. So, uh, what do you say now, 10, uh, ten years later? <laughs> I would still like to write that dinosaur game someday. Uh, and you still haven't <laughs> found the way to make it. I haven't cool. <laughs> figured out the right right approach. I think there's uh, dinosaurs are, are just so much fun. But are you going to be just one dinosaur? Is it a shooter, a dinosaur shooter, or, you know, or, is it, or is it civilization where you're controlling hundreds and thousands? Of, I, I'm not sure exactly where the fun is there yet, but, but hopefully someday I'll figure it out. Okay. Um, for the uh, history aspect of uh, some, some of your game, uh, mainly civilization, uh, do you hire historians or, or do you have like uh, very history-friendly developers? Or? <laughs> we actually have a saying in terms of history that we, we do the research after the game is finished because we want to we, we want to make the game fun and so we'll even if something isn't exactly historically correct we can always find something to to explain uh, why we put this feature in a game or why this why this was important um, a lot of the history um, that we put in the game a lot of times when we start a game we will um, find some children's books you know about the topic whether it's pirates or, or railroads or um, or uh, a history and because that, that's something everybody knows we want the player to be able to start playing uh, not have to read the manual first before they can play or read some history book uh, so we, we we use kind of very um, ideas that everyone is familiar with to, to let you start playing and then we'll add a little more depth a little more detail the more you play the kind of more you learn but um, it, our games are really not about duplicating what happened before, but giving you the tools to create a new history, a new story, a new, you know, something new. So we're not trying to make everything happen exactly the way it happened in history, because that's already happened. Mm -hmm. uh, but we want you to experience what it, what it was like to for these things to be fresh and new uh, every time you play. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, which one of your games was the most advanced at the time it was released? <laughs> <laughs> I like to think Pirates was somewhat advanced the when first it, or the, the, the very first yeah. one, uh, combining role playing with action sequences, with strategy, with uh, sword fighting and, and some economics. I, I thought that we put together a lot of pieces uh, in an interesting way, trying to give it a, like a movie feeling of moving from scene to scene and kind of jumping over all the boring parts and taking you right to the the fun parts, um, the open world nature of it, uh, I think was one of the first games that really had that open world feeling you could travel wherever wherever you went, everywhere you wanted to. Um, I think there were some some pretty good ideas, brand new ideas in, in, in Pirates. Uh, hopefully our other games have had some good ideas too, but that one strikes me as pretty much everything we put in there hadn't really been tried before and, and I, I think it worked out pretty well. Okay. Um... Well, um, I've read that uh, um, Civilization 2 to 5 were uh, designed by a different lead designer. Was it hard for you to, to give away your baby? In that <laughs> it was actually a good collaboration. I mean, I was still in the building and could talk, but uh, after Civilization 1, you know, I had done everything I could think of for that game. I put every, all my good ideas into that game. And it was uh, it was good to get uh, Brian Reynolds, who, who designed Civ 2, had his own new ideas, and and we really found that um, you're pretty much burnt out after you do you design Civilization. You know, it's a it's a huge game, a lot of ideas that you're trying and taking out, 
So um, having a new designer come in for the uh, for the, for each uh, version, um, there's such a strong community out there. I mean, you know, it's not like somebody walked in off the street. This is like people who just love Civilization and have, have played it. Um, but they were there. You know, everyone says, "Oh, if I were to design it, I would do this and change this a little bit." And so having new people uh, come in that, but people who kind of understood the core of the game and why why it's one more turn and, and what works has made each version uh, new but still uh, something that will appeal to the Civilization fan. So that's worked out pretty well, I think. Okay. Um, do you have any insight about Civilization VI? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing that we are able to talk about today. I'm sorry. Okay, so it's, uh, it's coming in a... Uh, like uh, a <laughs> few months, no, uh, years, no, and uh, <laughs> no. you can talk about I'm it. I'm not. Can you I mean, confirm it's, it's I uh, cannot it's confirm being, or deny. Yeah. Oh, okay. or I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Starships uh, is, uh, seems to be for different gamers than uh, your uh, previous games. Uh, do you expect the uh, old fans uh, to, <laughs> to play Starships too? We're certainly hoping all of our fans will play Starship, that it's, it's a strategy game, but it is not a civilization game. It's, um, it's a different approach, maybe a little bit more like XCOM, where you have a strategy layer and you're planning your moves, but then you go into individual missions, individual combat. Uh, so it's a, there's a lot of strategy involved in building your starships and deciding where to travel, which missions to take on. And then once you get into the mission, there's a neat map with asteroids and all sorts of cool tactics that you can use in the in the battles based on the, the systems you put on your starships. So it's a very uh, very cool uh, strategy game, but it's it's not a civ it's not a civ game. Okay, um, you, you said to uh, in an interview to Le Monde, um, you said that you believe our future is not there, um, but uh, <laughs> not in the close future. So um, do you think uh, it's it's in some decades or centuries or? <laughs> I think it'll certainly take us a while to get to the stars. Um, we live on a beautiful planet, and <laughs> uh, but I think it's inevitable in the same way that we traveled to the moon and now we're talking about traveling to Mars and sending uh, robots to different planets and now to asteroids. Some, some of our satellites, uh, our, our spaceships are leaving the, the solar system. I think it's inevitable that we'll eventually travel uh, to other planets and, and perhaps outside of our outside of our, our solar system. I'm sure there's lots of new technology we'll need to develop before we can do that, but uh, right now we live in a great world. We get to play video games, you know, so <laughs> I'm, I'm not looking, I'm not anxious to leave the planet. Okay, but if you were uh, like a multi-billionaire businessman, uh, would you invest in space conquest like uh, Elon Musk or Richard, Richard Branson? <laughs> uh, I, think that, I think that's exciting what they're doing with, uh, with SpaceX and things like that. Um, I, um, wow, that's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there's some problems on the earth probably that we would, we would try and solve first. I mean, I, I really, uh, actually appreciate the, the electric, electric vehicles and uh, Elon Musk and his, his, his Tesla. I think solving the earth's problem is probably the first priority before we're ready to, uh, go off into space. Okay. Um, in his book's uh, Foundation, do you know Asimov? Yes, uh, Isaac Asimov. Uh, Isaac Asimov uh, pictures the quest for the not lost planet Earth. Uh, so do you think it would be a good idea for an extension pack to Starships? <laughs> <laughs> we actually talked about that idea of is there some mysterious goal at the end of the game, like uh, like discovering the, uh, the remnants of what, what's happened to the Earth since we left many hundreds of years ago. Um, uh, and that would be an interesting um, uh, sequel, but I think in, in our games we're not trying to create a story that we're telling. We're trying to, we just write the first chapter of the story and then we let the player create the rest of the story. So we wouldn't, we don't want there to be just one ending to our story. We want you as the player to decide, am I going to build this incredible starship fleet and, and capture the, the entire galaxy or am I going to work for a technology victory or whatever. So. Uh, the ending isn't something that we, um, we've already decided. The ending is something that the player creates as they uh, journey through the game. Okay, okay. Uh, is there anything from your game uh, Pirates uh, in Starships? Because uh, I thought it would be uh, the, the ship, uh, the crew management, uh, things like that. There are a few ideas that we used in Pirates in, uh, in Starships. 
certainly the idea that you have this fleet uh, and that you have crew in your, on your fleet and that you can uh, decide uh, configuring your, your, your ships or your, your starships. Uh, but the, the idea of the, the morale of the crew or the, or the efficiency of the crew is something that we, we also had in, in, in Pirates. But this is a brand new world in starships. There's, mm -hmm. uh, every planet has a different adventure on it. And uh, in some ways there's, there's similarities, but it, it's certainly a, a very different game. Okay. And uh, could, you, could you tell us a bit more about the link between starships and Beyond Earth? <clears throat> the starships and Beyond Earth are connected uh, first in terms of the story. The, the um, <clears throat> Beyond Earth starts with humanity having to leave Earth and traveling to many different uh, planets and starting all over again, uh, creating a new civilization with brand new technology and, and really advanced uh, cool stuff, but it, it, it ends when you fully uh, finish that adventure on that planet. And Starships kind of starts at that point, when you're ready to leave the planet and go back into the galaxy and explore. So it's really the, the next chapter in the Beyond Earth story, as far as story is concerned. Uh, the games are separate. You can play Beyond Earth and not play Starships, or you can play Starships and not play Beyond Earth. They're not uh, that you have to play one or uh, have to play them both together. But there's some interesting connections in that if you're playing Beyond Earth, you can uh, start a Starships game with kind of the same world, the same leaders that are in your Beyond Earth game will appear in your Starships game. Um, whatever affinity the leaders have in Beyond Earth, they will have the same affinity in Starships. Um, <clears throat> if two leaders are at war with each other or at peace, those same, that same war and peace, uh, those the war and alliances, will also be in your Starships game. So you can really make it the next chapter in the story. If you're playing a game Beyond Earth, you can continue that game in, in Starships. Okay, so it depends on uh, your experience with Beyond Earth. Uh, will, will, like, this experience will change your experience in Starships. Exactly, your Beyond Earth will create the starting conditions for a game of Starships, and then you can continue okay. the story on your own.